During the mid-4th century, the history of the church walked apace with the history of the Roman Empire. With the death of Constantine the Great, the rule of the empire divided among his three sons, Constantine II, Constans, and Constantius. In the power-hungry maneuverings that followed, they did their upbringing in a Christian education little honor. They quickly and brutally removed any challenge by their father's relatives, and then set to work on one another. Three years after their father's death, they went to war with each other in a struggle for sole supremacy. Constantine II was slain by Constans, who was in turn murdered by a Gaelic commander of the Imperial Guard named Magnentius. After the defeat and the suicide of Magnentius, Constantius became the sole emperor and reigned until his death in 361. Now, Constantius departed from his father Constantine's wise policy of religious toleration. Constantius was greatly influenced by that Arian bishop of Constantinople, Eusebius, who we've already encountered in previous episodes. He inspired Constantius to use his authority as emperor to enforce Arianism, not only on the pagans of the empire, but also on Orthodox Nicene Christians. Paganism was violently suppressed, temples were pillaged and destroyed, with the loot taken from them given either to the church or Constantius's political cronies. As Christians had earlier been subject to arrest and execution, so now were pagans. And not unexpectedly, large numbers of them came over to the faith. Their conversion, of course, feigned. A similar persecution was applied toward Nicene Christians. They were punished with confiscation of their property and banishment. Constantius meddled in many of the church's affairs, which during his reign was fraught with doctrinal controversy. He called a multitude of councils in Gaul, Italy, Illyricum, and Asia. He fancied himself an accomplished theologian and enjoyed being called Bishop of Bishops. Constantius justified his violent suppression of paganism by likening it to God's command that Israel wipe out the idol-worshiping Canaanites. But intelligent church leaders like Athanasius argued instead for toleration. Athanasius wrote, Satan, because there is no truth in him, breaks in with axe and sword. But the Savior is gentle and forces no one to whom he comes, but knocks on and speaks to the soul. Open to me, my sister. If we open to him, he enters, but if we will not, he departs. For the truth is not preached by sword and dungeon, by the might of an army, but by persuasion and exhortation. How can there be persuasion where the fear of the emperor is uppermost? How exhortation, where the contradictory has to expect banishment and death? The ever-swinging pendulum of history foretells that the forced-upon faith propagated by Constantius will provoke a pagan reaction. That reaction came immediately after Constantius during the reign of his cousin, Julian, known as the Apostate. Julian only avoided the earlier purge of his family because he was too young to pose a threat. But as we all know, <laughs> the young grow up. Julian received a Christian education and was trained for a position in church leadership. But he nurtured a secret hatred for the religion of the court, a religion under which his family had been exterminated. He studied the banned texts of Eastern mystics and Greek philosophers, all the more thrilling because, well, they were forbidden. Julian became so immersed in paganism that he was made the leader of a secret order devoted to keeping the ancient religion alive. Despite his hostility towards Christianity, Julian recognized the faith was too deeply entrenched to turn back the sundial to a time when Christians were persona non grata. He decided instead to pry loose the influence they'd established in the civil realm. He appointed pagans to important imperial posts and reclaimed some of the pagan temples that had been turned into churches, reverting them to their original use. Julian enacted a policy of religious tolerance. Everyone was free to practice whatever faith they wanted. Now, make no mistake, Julian wanted to eliminate Christianity. He felt the best way to accomplish that wasn't by attacking it outright. After all, 200 years of persecution had already shown <laughs> that wasn't effective. Rather, Julian figured all the various sects of Christianity would go to war with one another and the movement would die the death of a thousand cuts, all of them self-inflicted. His plan didn't work out, of course, but it was an astute observation of how factious the followers of Christ can be. 
When Julian was killed in 363 in an ill-advised war against the Sassanids, the pagan revival that he'd hoped for fizzled. The reasons for its demise were many. Because paganism is an amalgam of contradictory beliefs and worldviews, it lacked the cohesion needed to stare down Christianity. And compared to the virtuous morality and ethical priorities of Christianity, paganism paled. Julian's hope for elimination of Christianity by allowing its various sects to operate side by side it never materialized. On the contrary, major advances were made toward a mutual understanding of the doctrinal debates that had divided them. The old Athanasius was still around, and as an elder statesman for the church, he'd mellowed, making him a rallying point for different groups. He called a gathering of church leaders in Alexandria in 362, right in the middle of Julian's reign, to recognize the Nicene Creed as the church's official creedal statement, and his resolution passed. Now that's quite a turnaround from the place he'd been years before when he felt that he stood all alone against the error of Arianism and said, you'll remember, Athanasius contra mundum, Athanasius against the world. But trouble was brewing in the important city of Antioch. While the Western churches under the leadership of the Bishop of Rome remained steadfast in their loyalty to the Nicene Creed, the Eastern Empire leaned towards Arianism. Antioch in Syria was a key eastern city split between adherents of Nicaea and Arianism. The official church, and that is the one that was recognized by the emperor in Constantinople, had an Arian bishop. The Nicaean Christians were led by Bishop Paulinus in a separate fellowship. But in 360, a new bishop rose to lead the Arian church at Antioch, and he was a devoted Nicaean named Miletius. Now, this occurred right at a time when more and more Eastern bishops were coming out in favor of the Nicene Creed. These Eastern bishops supported Miletius and the new Nicaeans of Antioch. Now, we might think that this would see a merger of the old Nicaeans under Paulinus with the new and, we'd assume wrongly, <laughs> Rome and the Western Church considered Paulinus as the rightful bishop of Antioch and remained suspicious of Miletius and the new Nicaeans efforts on their part to negotiate with and be accepted by the Western Church were rebuffed. This served to increase the divide between East and West that had been brewing for the previous few decades. A new center of spiritual weight developed at this time in Cappadocia in Central Eastern Asia Minor. It formed around the careers of three able church leaders, Basil the Great, his brother Gregory of Nyssa, and their friend Gregory of Nazianzus. Their work answered the lingering concerns that hovered around the words the Nicene Council had chosen to describe Jesus as being of the same substance as the Father. These three Cappadocian fathers were able to convince their Eastern brothers that the Nicene Creed was the best formulation that they were likely to produce, and that to accept that Jesus was of the same substance as the Father, and so God, not a similar substance, and so something other than or less than God, as the Arians had held it. They pressed in on terms that made it clear there was only one God, but three persons who individually are and taken together comprise that one God, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. They said the three operated inseparably, none ever acting independently of the others. Every divine action begins from the Father, proceeds through the Son, and is completed in the Holy Spirit. In 381, at the Council of Constantinople, the Eastern Church demonstrated its acceptance of the Cappadocian Fathers' theology by affirming their adherence to the Nicene Creed. This effectively marked the end of Arianism within the Empire. And unlike the previous three ecumenical councils, the Council of Constantinople was not followed by years of bitter strife. What the Council failed to do was resolve the split in the Church at Antioch. The West continued to support the old Nicaeans, while the East supported the new. It was clear that all the tension was building between the old seat of the imperial power and the new capital, that is, between Rome and Constantinople. Which church and bishop would be the recognized leader of the whole? Antioch became the site where that contest was lived out through their surrogates, Paulinus and Miletius. The Council of Constantinople attempted to deal with this contest by developing a system 
for how the churches would be led. The rulings of the council and all the church councils held during these years are called canon law, which established policy by which the church could operate. One of the rulings of the Council of Constantinople established what were known as dioceses. Now, a diocese was a group of provinces that became a region over which a bishop presided. The rule was that one diocese could not interfere in the workings of another. Each was to be autonomous. Though Jovian followed Julian as emperor in 363, his reign was short. He followed a policy of religious toleration, as did Valentinian I, who succeeded him. Valentinian recognized the empire as too vast for one man to rule and appointed his younger brother Valens to rule in the east. Valens was less tolerant than his brother and attacked both paganism and the Nicene Christians. But Valens was the last Arian to rule in either east or west. All subsequent emperors were orthodox. That is, they followed the Nicene Creed. When Valentinian died in 375, the rule of the Western Empire fell to his son, Gratian. When Valens died, Gratian chose an experienced soldier named Theodosius to rule the East. Gratian and Theodosius presided over the final demise of paganism. Both men strongly supported the Orthodox faith, and at the urging of Bishop Ambrose of Milan, they enacted policies that brought an end to pagan worship. Now, of course, Individuals scattered throughout the empire continued to secretly offer sacrifices to idols and went through the superstitious rituals of the past. But as a social institution with temples and a priesthood, paganism was effectively eradicated. Under the reign of Theodosius, Christianity was made the official religion of the Roman Empire. We're going to end this episode with a look at how the church at Rome emerged during the 4th and 5th centuries to become the lead church in the empire. Now, in theory, all the bishops of the empire's many churches were equal. In reality, from the time of the Apostolic Fathers, some did gain greater prominence because their churches were in more important cities. During the 2nd and 3rd centuries, Alexandria, Antioch, Rome, and Carthage were the places of the greatest spiritual gravity. Their senior pastors were recognized as leaders, not just of their churches, but of the church. The Council of Nicaea in 325 recognized Alexandria as the lead church for all of North Africa, Antioch in the East and Rome as preeminent in the West. Constantinople, the new Eastern political capital, was added to that list in 381 by the Council of Constantinople. As one of its rulings in canon law, the Council declared that Constantinople was second only to Rome in terms of primacy in deciding church matters. Now, we might assume that the Bishop of Rome would gladly accept this finding of the Council, being that it acknowledged the Roman See, um, that is, the Bishop's realm as his authority, called a See, that the Roman See was primary. But the Roman Bishop didn't see it that way. He objected because the Council's ruling implied that the position of a church and its bishop depended on the status of their city in the empire. In other words, it was the nearness of the center to political power that weighed the most. The Bishop of Rome maintained that the preeminence of Rome wasn't dependent on political proximity, but on historical precedent. He said the decree of a synod or a council couldn't convey primacy. The Roman Bishop claimed Rome was primary because God had made it so. At a council in Rome a year after the Council of Constantinople, the Roman bishop Damasus said that Rome's primacy rested on the Apostle Peter's founding of the Roman Church. Ever since the mid-3rd century, Roman Christians had used Matthew 16, Luke 22, and John 21 to claim that their church possessed a unique authority over other churches and bishops. This Petrine theory, as it's come to be known, was generally accepted by the end of the 6th century. It claimed that Peter had been given primacy over his fellow apostles, and his superior position had been passed on to him from his successors, the bishops of Rome, by apostolic succession. Now, in truth, there was already a substantial church community in Rome when Peter arrived in Rome and was martyred. The Christians honored Peter as they did all their martyrs by making his grave a popular gathering place. Eventually, it became a shrine, and then, when persecution ended, the shrine became a church, the leader of that church became associated with Peter, whose grave was its central feature. 
When Constantine came to power, he ordered a basilica built on the site on Vatican Hill. To mark that a new day of favor toward the church had come, Constantine gave the Lateran Palace, where the Roman Empress had lived, to the Bishop of Rome as his residence. But the story that arose later, which puts the Emperor Constantine on his face before Pope Sylvester, the Bishop of Rome, pleading forgiveness in sackcloth and ashes, and handing over to him the rule of Italy and Rome, that's a fiction. Until Bishop Damasus in the mid-fourth century, the Roman bishops were competent leaders of the church, but tended towards weakness when dealing with the emperors, who often sought to dominate the faith. A dramatic change occurred at the end of the fourth century when, under Ambrose of Milan, the church dictated to the emperor. Bishop Damasus, a contemporary of Ambrose, installed the primacy of Peter as a central part of church doctrine. He claimed that the Roman church was started by Peter, who had passed on his authority to the next bishop, who in turn had handed it to his successor, and that each bishop of Rome was a recipient of Peter's apostolic authority. Since Peter was the leader of the apostles, that meant that the Roman church was the lead church and its bishop the leader, not just of Rome, but of all Christendom. Damasus was the first to address other bishops as sons rather than brothers. Historical events during the 4th and 5th centuries enhanced the power of the Bishop of Rome. When Constantine moved the political capital to Constantinople in 330, it left the Roman bishop as the strongest individual in Rome for long stretches of time. People in the West looked to him for temporal as well as spiritual leadership when a crisis arose. Constantinople and the emperor were hundreds of miles and weeks away. The Roman bishop was near, and so people turned to him for the exercise in authority of political as well as spiritual crises. In 410, when Alaric and the Visigoths sacked Rome, Bishop Innocent I used clever diplomacy to save the city from the torch. When the Western Empire finally fell in 476, the people of Italy looked to the Roman bishop for civil as well as religious leadership. Great leaders like Cyprian, Tertullian, and Augustine were outstanding men of the Western Church who counted themselves as being under the leadership of the Bishop of Rome. The Western Empire had also managed to stay free of the heretical challenges that had racked the East, most notably that brouhaha with Arius and his followers. This doctrinal solidarity was due in large part to the steadfast leadership of Rome's bishops. Another factor that contributed to Rome's rise to dominance was the decline of the other great centers. Jerusalem lost its place due to the Bar Kokhba rebellion of the second century. Alexandria and Antioch were overrun by the Muslims in the sixth and seventh centuries, leaving Constantinople and Rome as the centers of power. In an imperial edict in AD 445, the Emperor Valentinian III recognized the supremacy of the Bishop of Rome in spiritual affairs. What he enacted became canon law for all. Another great boon to the influence and prestige of the Roman bishop was the missionary work of monks who were loyal to Rome. Clovis and Augustine planted churches in northern France and Britain, all owing allegiance to Rome. But above all, the Roman church was led by several able bishops during this time, men who overlooked no opportunity to enhance and extend their power. Leo I was bishop at Rome from 440 to 461, and by far the ablest occupant of the bishop's seat until Gregory I, 150 years later. His skill earned him the title Leo the Great. Now, we're not sure when Rome's bishops began to be called Pope, a title which for years had been used by the Bishop of Alexandria, but Leo was the first to refer consistently to himself as Pope which is from the Latin, a child's affectionate term for Papa. In 452, Leo persuaded Attila the Hun to let the city of Rome alone. And then three years later, when the Vandals came to sack the city, Leo convinced them to limit their loot fest to just two weeks. The Vandal leader Gezerek kept his word, and the Romes forever after esteemed Leo as the one who saved their city from destruction. Pope Leo insisted that all church courts and the rulings of all bishops had to be submitted to him for a final decision. This is what Valentinian III's edict of 445 granted, and he was determined to apply it. 
Pope Galatius I, who ruled from 492 to 496, said that God gave sacred power to the Pope and royal power to the king. But because the Pope had to account to God for the king at the judgment, the sacred power of the Pope was more important than royal power. So civil rulers should submit to the Pope. While emperors didn't all automatically knuckle under to the popes, most did resign a large part of authority and political influence to the Roman bishops. <laughs>